that's not what we need. We don't need this individualistic, this rugged individualism bullshit. All right, kind of leads us into the next topic, <laughs> uh, which is the Homes Strike of 1892. Um, I wanted to talk about this because I'm from, I'm, I live in Pittsburgh. Um, you know, I'm, I'm originally from India, but I, but I live in Pittsburgh. And, uh, you know, this has been a part of, like, the city's history forever. Uh, so I wanted to talk about it because I, I, cause it is an important strike. And especially, like, it does give you some insight on stuff that I've, um, that I just kind of ranted and raved about in just a few minutes ago. Um, so there's a couple of important things to consider when we talk about the Homestead Strike of 1892. And everything actually starts a decade earlier. Uh, so the Amalgamate Association of Iron and Steel Workers, which was the union at the time, um, c basically controlled the, the Homestead Steel Plant, and it uh, set a bunch of rules defining work and, um, you know, the bosses and Ar Andrew Carnegie um, and all these big, giant, like, steel plant guys. Um, they hated it. They hated these rules. They hated these rules because uh, it... It was a hindrance to maximizing outputs and profits. Basically, they couldn't work people to their bones. They couldn't work people to dire exhaustion uh, day in and day out, giving them pittance, giving them very little bit for that labor um, and collecting a large chunk of the profits for themselves. And um, the way this was achieved was, you know, starting in 1882, there was a bunch of strikes. Um, and through these strikes, uh, there was retaliation from law enforcement. The sheriff's office got involved. A bunch of a bunch of you know regular people were deputized. There was a bunch of violence, um, and particularly in Homestead, in Homestead, Pennsylvania, um, the two thousand town pe townspeople stood in solidarity every time there was a strike, and they achieved the right of collective bargaining. And that collective bargaining is what gave them these defined work rights. Uh, that the that the bosses hated, and this was in 1889, um, and then three years later, they would uh, come back to the collective bargaining table, and you know talk about what's working, what isn't. Let's negotiate something that is conti like continually trying to make things better um, for the workplace. Right. That's that was sort of the 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 way that this was set up. Now, Andrew Carnegie it was was essentially the way that Andrew Carnegie is seen is fraudulent. Um, he publicly would sit there and say, oh, I support the unions. I think they're great. They're good people. Um, and then, you know, it would be like, what we need is this Christian brotherhood in this country because America is built on this Christian brotherhood. Right. And uh, because he came because he spoke to these people because he came from. Um, from a life of poverty, he was an, he was an Irish immigrant and he struggled, um, but uh, you know he 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 got to the top uh, by making these like ruthless business deals by essentially stepping over his neighbor by by putting the boots to people's throats. That's just how he operated, um, and he's reviled for it, right? Like uh, or or revi is reviled the right word for this? Um, but but everybody thinks of him as this great person that built this city, you know, that, that he's somebody revered, he's revered for it, um, not re revered for it, right? Everybody kind of uh, puts him up on this pedestal. Uh, you know, we have, a, we have a school here, Carnegie Mellon University, and he's, obviously his name is, is in there. We, there's a bunch of libraries that have his name associated with it. And everybody thinks he's a mate because he, cause he was cutthroat, right? He, he, and, and this is something that people, um, people kind of want, you know, this is the culture that is bred in America because we look at these people as heroes. We look at these people as amazing people, people that, that, you know, were, were cutthroat and ruthless and didn't give a shit about their fellow man. And then on, on a public basis would talk about brotherhood, would talk about coming together and solidarity and all this shit. Right. But in reality, they didn't, they didn't live their life like that. You know, so uh, Carnegie made all these speeches. He built these, you know, built these libraries and would talk about it. And But in private, a lot of what he was talking about were crushing the unions. He was a, he hated collective bargaining. He hated collective bargaining. Um, he thought collective bargaining was a waste of time. And uh, he, he was basically like, why would... Um, 
why would I want collective bargaining when I'm the one that built this empire by myself? You know, the employees didn't go out there. These, these fucking skilled and unskilled laborers didn't go out there to, to make these crushing investment blows. I fucking did that. I'm the one that, that made all this shit happen, right? So he, and he basically said, I'm the one that um, determines what these workers do. So he kind of had this very like dictatorial view um, on employment, and and this and this is the guy that we all revere, right? This is the guy that we're supposed to be like, oh, he's the best. Look at this guy, huh? This guy's gonna fucking shiv you in the night, you know? He's gonna be, and that's 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 what you gotta do. That's success right there, you know? Is fucking backstabbing, ruthless, a fucking uncaring, sociopathic shit. That's fucking amazing. That's what we need. Is and that's how it's seen. Now, um, he put. He didn't physically go to the Homestead plant, right? Like, he was never at the Homestead plant. Uh, but he put a guy named Henry Clay Frick in charge of the home plant, Homestead plant. And now publicly, again, he was going out there making union solidarity speeches, and he said he would never use strike breakers. If it came down to a strike because collective bargaining had failed, um, he would never use strike breakers. He would try to figure out a way to make sure that these people were taken care of. That was that was the way that he operated. But on, on a private notice, uh, he told Frick to never um, never legitimize the union again. Basically make sure that you don't give in to collective bargaining um, and you make the union look foolish and you and you delegitimize them. Don't recognize the union's demands. And he said this privately and Henry Frick never released it because Henry Frick uh, basically, you know, believed the same thing that Andrew Carnegie believed. He believed that, you know, that's the way that you do business. If you want to succeed, you got to step over the corpse of the other guy. You know, you don't help somebody that's in trouble. You fucking make sure that they are dead. That's the way that that's that's their business. And, and that's revered. Again, this idea that this this notion of, of callousness and this real, like, this sociopathy and, and then basically d this dictatorial mentality of running the workplace, um, you know, is, is sort of what's championed. Um, and, and, and this is the mentality that's continually championed in America, and that's why we're in the current situation that, that we're in. Um, now, within the homestead plant itself, 800 out of 3,800 workers by 1982 were represented by the AA union. Right, which is that amalgamated association of iron workers and steel workers. Uh, but we talked about this a couple of weeks ago. Uh, regardless of whether you are a, uh, a card carrying, due paying member of the union, the unions are going to represent everybody. They represent every single worker. That's what they do. You know, they're they're not just going to represent a couple of people. No, that's they they represent everybody. Whether whether you pay into the union or not, um, the unions. And, the, and, you know, the, the union leaders are going to go to bat for you, uh, at, at, you know, as, as, as an employee of uh, a particular trade, a particular skill, a particular industry, and, and so on and so forth, right? So um, they ramp up the, the collective bargaining talks. And they're like, hey, you know, this is what we think needs to happen. This is our list of demands for going forward. We, you know, some things worked, some things didn't. We'd like to change it this way. Um, and Frick basically was not like he was ordered to do. And, and he personally believed that the unions were all shit. They were all bullshit. Um, so he responded by cutting every worker's pay by 22%. He's just like, ah, we're done. I'm not listening to your bullshit. Everybody gets less pay. And that's how it's going to be, right? Carnegie kept telling him that, you know, hey, make sure that you keep blocking their negotiations. Don't listen to what they have to say. Don't legitimize their their demands uh, because they're a hindrance to efficiency. Um, you know, the way that you get, obviously, obviously, the way that you get efficiency out of people is by overworking them, making sure they're completely exhausted, completely burned out, you know, so that they're mentally and physically um, ex just totally burned out and to the point where, yeah, they're probably going to make some mistakes along the way. And that's efficient. That is efficient. And if they make mistakes, you kill the worker because they're, you know, they're just 
they're just tools and peons to make Andrew Carnegie and all these fucking sociopathic uh, rich people more rich. That's all. That's all that really matters. Uh, what gives a shit about your you know, about your fellow man? Sure, you publicly say that, but privately, uh, you know, you wish death upon their family. That's America. And that's how you gotta do it, baby. That's how you play the game. That's how you get successful. That's how you beat the virus, obviously. So, Frick Frick basically, uh, there were 30 days to negotiate something. And, uh, And he just refused to negotiate with them. He wouldn't look at their list of demands. He wouldn't legitimize it. Uh, So, uh... Basically, at the end of that 30 days, if there wasn't a collective bargaining agreement reached, the unions would no longer be legitimate. They no longer would have any power um, and they would have to dissolve. Yeah. So uh, he literally locked out the workers because because of the unions. He locked them out. He built this huge like wooden fence with barbed wire on top and then he got these steel plates with snipers in these steel plates and some and then he also had like hot wa- uh, boiling hot water uh cannons that if um if any of these workers tried to come into the into the the plant he would you know fire uh hot water at them so so the workers see this and they make a a declaration uh to strike that was led by uh, what is his name here? I'm, uh, Huey O'Donnell. Huey O'Donnell was the leader of the strike. Um, and, uh, and this is what the declaration says. So let's read, let's read that. Make sure that everybody could see this declaration. We've got to move it a little bit. Every screen is different. Uh, but basically this, the, the employees in the mill of, uh, Mercer's, Carnegie, Phipps, and Company at Homestead, PA have built there a town with its homes, its schools, and its churches. For many years, been faithful co-workers with the company and business of the mill, have invested thousands of dollars in saving, it, it, savings in said mill in the expectation of spending their lives in Homestead and of working in the mill during the period of their efficiency. Therefore, the committee desires to express to the public as it, its firm belief that both the public and the employees uh, af- aforesaid have equitable rights and interest in the said mill, which cannot be modified or diverted without due process of the law, the, that the employees have the right to continuous employment in said mill during the efficiency and good behavior without regard to religious, political, or economic opinions or associations that it is against public policy and subversive of fundamental principles of American liberty that a whole community of workers should be denied employment or suffer any other social determinant on the account uh, of membership in a church, political party, or trade union, that it is our duty as American citizens to resist by every legal and ordinary means the unconstitutional, archaic, and revolutionary policy of Carnegie Company, which seems to invite a contempt for public and private interests and a disdain for the public conscience. Boom. Strike declaration. So they basically were like, you guys are, you guys are doing something illegal. You know, you guys are, you guys are not upholding the law. We have a right uh, to employment for this mill, we we have given our life to to essentially make this mill money. To and and we do we do efficient work. We have been doing efficient work. Um, so what you guys are doing is is illegal. It's not correct. Um, you're taking employment away from us uh, because we are part of a trade union, and that's uh, that's not correct. That's discriminatory, um, and it is discriminatory, right? Because they were they worked with AA. Uh, Henry Frick basically built this. Uh, this prison complex he built a prison complex um that they all nicknamed fort henry by the way right so he builds this thing and he locks them out and he expects them to just be fine with it uh and you know the what other recourse did they have they tried the collective bargaining and then they and then when it failed the you know uh, Henry Frick is like, well, your union doesn't matter. It's not important anymore. And then he builds a fucking prison tower around it. 
and he's like, well, now everything's fair. So you cut wages, you don't, you don't consider the unions to be legitimate, and you also lock your employees out. Um, and then he brings strike breakers in. So all this is like essentially making Henry Frick look like an asshole, you know. Um, meanwhile, Carnegie is going around giving speeches, talking about Christian Brotherhood and all this shit, right? Um, so in order, uh, so the the strikers build a, a human wall to make sure like none of the strike breakers can actually get into the into the uh, into the plant, so that they you know they can make money. Uh, now Carnegie, before all this, because he figured that they would probably strike because that's what happened before. He overworked them. Um, he he increased the productivity and efficiency of the plant. Um, you know because that because again that's that's a ruthless business decision, right? So you're like, ah, I see the plant coming, so I'm gonna I'm gonna fucking overwork the shit out of you guys. I'm gonna make sure that I'm ahead on everything that I need to because I'm seeing this thing coming. Um, and if I overwork you anyway, that's just you know you're you're gonna do it anyway, so I might as well overwork you kind of kind of a thing. So, uh, in order to protect these strike breakers and continue to make even more money, um, Frick hires the Pinkerton guards. The Pinkertons uh, were basically the mercenaries of that time. They were like the Blackwater of that time, right? And they were hired to protect the strike breakers, and they were going to come up through the Monongahela River because it was kind of secluded. Not a lot of people knew about that. And then they were going to go up the hill and make their way into the plant. Now... They they hired these Pinkerton guards, despite the fact that, um, you know, the union leaders, um, uh, Huey O'Donnell, had had said that they had no intention um, of, you know, uh, getting violent. But they will take up, the, but they're going to protect themselves. Uh, they're going to take protective measures, but they have no intention of getting violent. And... Uh, you know, these guys come up, and they had to do something. So they barric like they formed a human barricade. They they showed up to the Monongahela. This is July sixth, eighteen ninety two. And uh, somebody fired. It's it's unsure as to who fired. There's a lot of people that say, well, the union, you, you know, the union organizers are the ones that fired. The strikers are the ones that fired first. Um, there's others that say it was the Pinkerton guards. No one really knows. It's one of those things that's very disputed uh, amongst historians. But the the general consensus is that we're not sure who did it. Somebody fired and all hell starts breaking loose. Now, the thing to remember here is um, the union organizers and the Pinkerton guards themselves are not soldiers, right? The union, organi or, uh, the, the, the union organizers and, and the strikers are just workers. They're just employees. They work in the, they work in the fucking mill. That's where they work. Right, the Pinkerton guards were were just desperate out of work people. That's who they hired. So they pay them like two fifty a day, um, which is like a hundred bucks a day, right? And uh, and make sure that they're fed, um, and and that's why they would go. So some of these people that were there are just regular like out of out of work people or students. Some of them were students trying to earn enough money um, over the summertime to pay their way through the fall uh, semesters. Right. Which is crazy, which is, again, it's just like there's no reason why in the American economic system that somebody should either join a mercenary group or a fucking uh, or the military in order to afford school. Like that should not be the um, the reasoning to, to join the military. You know, the military shouldn't be like this financial hostage situation to be like, oh, if you come join us and go put your life on the line for a bunch of rich people, then we'll pay your way through school. We'll give you enough money that you can afford school. And it shouldn't be this, it's the same way for, for these fucking Pinkerton guards, right? It says, oh, come fight on behalf of uh, Henry Frick and Andrew Carnegie, and we'll make sure that you're paid for you know, your way through school. We're, we're, we'll make sure that you're fed, even though that you're not now. Like, that should not be a thing. It, it, it's very opportunistic, and it's very callous, but it's championed. It's revered. This guy's a good business guy. He's a fucking good business guy, this guy. You know, whole, the financial hostage situation? That's good business, this guy. He's a genius. Put him, put him, on, put him on some kind of currency, this fucking guy. 
Now, the Strikers also had acquired a cannon. <laughs> I was like, where the fuck did you guys get a cannon from? Uh, but none of them knew how to operate it. And, you know, it backfired on them and uh, somebody got hurt. This was a fucking disaster. This, the, this, this whole battle um, on July 6th was a disaster, right? It, there was a point where the Strikers controlled the plant and then there was a point where the Pinkertons controlled the plant and it just kept going back and forth. But eventually the Pinkertons surrendered and they were like, look, a bunch of people are dying. There's a bunch of people that are uh, injured. We're not sure if this is friendly fire or not. This is crazy. So we're getting the fuck out of here, right? And that was, that was a day. Like that whole day was a goddamn disaster. So on July 7th, the PA State Guard gets called in. And um, basically, Huey O'Donnell was like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll treat them like they're people, right? I'll go, I'll go say hello. I'll, I'll try to shake the general's hand. We'll try to have a little bit of a, a, a conversation. Maybe they're willing to do some collective bargaining situation, right? Maybe they're willing to listen to, 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 to all, all us workers here. And um, at first, you know, the original general was kind of like, I don't want to really do much of anything. But once he saw that there was uh, so much support, he was like, okay, like the whole town was supporting these union people. And he was basically like, we got to do something because we're paid to protect the interests of rich people. And these guys are not in the interests of rich people. So 4,000 soldiers uh, surrounded the town that supported these unions. Um that supported the strikers and uh you know Huey O'Donnell tries to go talk to them and it doesn't work um and by force the strikers get broken up the the whole thing gets broken up this is basically like um if you in if you got like invited uh a friend of yours over for dinner but instead of actually just coming over for dinner uh, your friend invites the local gun club to surround your house um, and then takes your wife and children hostage um, and asks you to stop being unreasonable. That's kind of what this situation is. So uh, by July 12th, the strike was done. It collapsed. It was over. Uh, you know, so lasted a little over a week, I think. Uh, July 18th, Homestead goes under martial law uh, under the order of Henry Frick. And during this time, there was an anarchist uh, named Alexander Berkman, uh, kind of misguided, didn't really plan this out very well. Uh, he was married to Emma Goldman, um, who I'm a fan of Emma Goldman. Um, uh, from what I've read, I've, I've, I've read a little of Emma Goldman, not a significant chunk of what Emma Goldman um, has to say. But from what I've read, I like uh, but this seems like this wasn't particularly great on her part. Um, but they planned it together, and he came down from New York, and he was going to assassinate Henry Frick, right? Uh, he was going to kill Henry Frick. And he fails because he'd never fired a gun before, right? And, uh, yeah, he never fires a gun. Uh, and, he, and he, like grazes his neck or something and the union organizers you know Huey O'Donnell and everybody are just like oh Jesus Christ like this this guy is not part of our movement we don't want to associate ourselves with him but you know the damage was done the union started losing support after this um, assassination attempt and uh, basically whatever Carnegie had set up before the strike began is how things continue to move forward uh so the so the unfortunate thing was that the unions lost in this situation after they gained traction too you know they'd gained collective bargaining rights they were they were starting to do you know starting to get some provisions for the workers that were going to treat them like you know just regular people um and uh the union leaders get charged with conspiracy and frick took all the heat he took all the heat right henry frick got all the heat he was called a tyrant. He he was called, uh, you know, a, a, he like betrayed the people. Um, a bunch of people started turning on Henry Frick. Uh, and the reason for that is because of the separation of the manager versus the owner. You know, uh, there was a very clear separation of the manager versus the owner. Because Andrew Carnegie knew that this was going to look bad. 
Yeah, he he knew that this was not gonna he he wasn't gonna look great. So he's going around fucking opening up libraries and shit, you know, get getting museums for the people, talking about Christian brotherhood and solidarity and how he loves unions and they're the best, you know. But, but I got a friend of mine in the union, you know. One of my one of my best friends is a union organizer. One, of, you know, I had a I I knew a cousin once that uh, that thought about joining a union and then said, "Fuck it, I'll just." work in terrible conditions and and that's christian brother and he's going around saying shit like that so everybody on a, on a public level saw andrew carnegie to be amazing but in secret he's talking about busting up unions he's 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 you know um saying that they're a hindrance that he wants them crushed that he wants them left without any power i'm the i'm the fucking sole person that decides how these workers should be treated because i'm the one making all the money you know, so very real sociopathic stuff. And then he sold this guy who believed the same thing that put his, essentially put his life on the line. He sold him down the river, all three of them. So um, Frick was seen, you know, as the raw nerve of, of vengeance, you know, this, of, and he became like the face of uh, capitalistic greed. Um, and he was used as a scapegoat. He got vilified in the press as somebody that's like that, you know, used force to bust up these unions and, um, you know, uh, under 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 Carnegie's order, um, he denounced the unions and he cut wages for for the people of Homestead. Um, and this is and this is sort of the, the tipping point of Frick and Carnegie's relationship which is uh, Carnegie's opening up this new library in Homestead, which I'm pretty sure is still there. Um, and while he's opening up uh, the library, he makes this big speech and he basically says, you know, if, if I had been in charge, if I was the manager um, of the plant during the strike of 1892, um, there would have been no violence. I would have, I would have happily collectively bargained and uh, I would have I would have happily listened to what the workers have to say because you guys you guys are the fucking best you know I fucking love you you guys are great look at this library I built for you I, I put ten books in there you know and one of those books uh, has to do with that uh, you know socialism thing I, I I mean I put a red tape around it but it's there you know it's in there nobody should read it but it's in there. You know, so he basically claims that he would have had, had no violence. He would have been amazing. And uh, and Frick basically goes, well, fuck this guy. I'm done with him. I'm out. I'm out. I'm out. So he so they basically go grow estranged. They stop talking to each other. So in 1919, um, which was a big year for for the labor movement, you know, you had the Seattle general strike, you had the Winnipeg general strike, you had the Boston police strike, you had a bunch of different other strikes that popped up because of that uh, all around the country. And then you also had the deathbed of Andrew Carnegie all happening in 1919. Big, big year for labor movements there. Uh, Andrew Carnegie, uh, you know, was missing his old friend and... Uh, it, you know, it felt really terrible about not seeing Henry Frick as, as much and basically was like, I want to make amends. I want to talk to, to my friend Henry Frick, which this is how out of touch he is. This is how out of touch fucking Henry Frick is, right? Or I'm sorry, Andrew Carnegie this is how out of touch he is. He sold his friend down the river, this guy that was loyal to him this whole time, right? And just sold himself down the river so he can look good and but and you know privately bust the union and collect all the profits and become super rich and give nothing back to the people right he didn't realize what he had actually done to henry frick or the or the people um and is and is sitting there pretending like oh man i miss this guy he was so great he was so good i hope he'll talk to me again i hope he'll talk to me again uh so you know carnegie's people send a message to henry frick and Frick writes, uh, writes back uh, this. He says, please tell Mr. Carnegie I will see him soon in hell where we are both going. Because Henry Frick, I think, realized what he had done. That um, by treating the workers the way that he had, just based on that quote, you know, uh, by treating the workers the way that he had, um, you know, he, he really, he really failed to, to be a good Christian, uh, to, 
to, to stand by his fellow man. Um, and he had also realized that he pledged allegiance to the wrong person. He pledged allegiance to a, a greed monger. Someone that wasn't going to ever help him out. And someone that still doesn't realize what they've done. On your deathbed, too. On your deathbed. Um, you know, so my... When I look back on this sort of stuff, um, I look at Andrew Carnegie as the representation of what um, what capitalism really is, what we are championing as a society. Uh, if we go back to the earlier part of our conversation, the earlier portion of the video uh, where we talked about the new normal, um, Andrew Carnegie represents the oligarch oligarchical normal. You know, this guy really represents... Uh, the status quo, what we what we are aiming to achieve, this greed driven capitalism that that kind of runs the country, this this reverence that we have for people that have no compassion, that have no idea of building a collective future for humanity. Uh, they they do have an idea of of how to capitalize on uh, other people's work and other people's labor. They do have an idea of masquerading as champions of democracy, but really wanting to run, uh, you know, the their their industry with a dictatorial iron fist, of a fist that I'm sure their that that their workers made uh, and received very little, if if any, of the profit. That's who Andrew Carnegie represents. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, please give it a like and a subscribe and a share. Share it out with your friends, your enemies, whoever you think would enjoy content like this. I'm going to be putting out videos like this every single day. So make sure you are subscribed to the channel uh, and make sure you hit that bell so you get all the alerts from all the videos that I put out there. Uh, and uh, and if you if you have the means to, uh, please consider making a, a donation. I know we are all in tough times, but if you if you can, uh, you can become a sustaining member or make a one time donation at ramennoodlescomedy.com slash donate. You can check out various different ways of becoming a sustaining member or just make a one-time donation. Uh, while you're on my website, you can also check out all of my past comedy albums, which are available on all of your favorite streaming and um, downloading websites, if that's, that's, if that's a way that you can you say that. Uh, <laughs> but they're also available on Bandcamp, which uh, right now is giving the most back to artists. Uh, but also on my Bandcamp, they are all available for a pay what you want. If you would like to enjoy some live stand-up comedy albums from me and you don't have the means, if you're in tough times, that's totally fine. You can download it for free. Go ahead and get it for free and enjoy it. Uh, or if you do and if you want somebody else to enjoy it, you can get it to them as a gift. Uh, that's also a, a recommended thing. Uh, but most importantly, thank you guys for tuning into this video. Um, thank you guys for, for all the people that have already donated, that have already become patrons. I really appreciate it. You guys are amazing. And uh, until the next video, we'll see you on the road. Thank you, guys.